Everybody good? Glad to be at church. Hey, I don't know if you heard or not, but I'm a grandpa now. Yeah! And uh, I am going to be amazing at it. Um, I was sitting there, I finally got to hold her last night, and uh, of course we couldn't be in the hospital with her, but I was in I was in Phoenix. I left for Phoenix Wednesday morning, got to go to a conference called Pioneering Change, and I got to go share the real life story. So I got to go bla- brag on you guys for uh, about three days, and on Friday morning I was in my hotel room, and still not dealing well with the two hour time difference, and uh, my phone rang, and it was Jennifer, and she said, hey, uh, Kaylee's going to the hospital. And so I immediately got on the phone with the airline and said, hey, I know I'm not supposed to come home till tomorrow, but what are the odds? that you could get me home today. And they got me home on Friday, and so I was able to get here. Now, I I got into Dallas, and my connecting flight got into Dallas, and I got a phone call from Jay. She said, she's here! Sent me pictures, sent me the the, the weight and everything, 7 pounds, 12 ounces, healthy baby, got a round fat head like they're supposed to. And, um, well, you know what I mean? Like, some babies, right, who got that weird head? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't stay weird. I mean, for the most part, (laughs) it doesn't stay weird. But like hers has got a good head, good looking baby, and, and so I just started crying. I'm I'm an emotional one, so I'm in the plane getting ready to to deboard the plane, and, and and I exit the plane, and I am bawling in my seat. Stewardess walks up, sir, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm perfectly fine. I just had a grandbaby, and she starts crying, and so. <laughs> And so, like, I'm telling people as I'm walking out, and I walk up into the terminal at Dallas, and I forget because I got to wear a mask the whole time you're in the airport. And so I got my mask on, I got my my hat pulled down over my eyes, and I am just red from all the way across here because I am crying. And I frightened a few people because I was telling everybody I stopped, I got something to eat at Dallas, and I'm telling the people at Wingstop in the airport, but I just had a grandbaby, and like, who are you, sir? And I'm like, it doesn't matter, (laughs) doesn't matter. So Saturday, I finally get a chance to sit down with her last night. Man, it's great. We're sitting there, and I'm holding the baby. And you grandparents in the house, put your hands up. Your grandparent in the house. Listen, listen, listen. You have to tell more of the story. Because all I've heard my whole life is, oh, just wait, just wait. When you become a grandparent, it's all different. It's different. Their grandkids are so much better than your own kids. (laughs) That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Now, if you're someone's own child, let me just... No, it's better. It's just better. And so... I'm sitting there and I'm holding this baby and it's amazing how quickly, how quickly I'm looking at this kid that I've never met in my entire life. And I'm holding her and I love her and I can't help but love her. And then the grandparent moment happened. I'm like, I get to love this one as much as I love my own, but I don't have to pay for it. And I started crying all over again. I was like, no, I'm just kidding. No, we're blessed, man. Kaylee's doing really well. They're home. The baby's doing really well. Uh, everybody's healthy, and we're so thankful that God has seen fit to bless our family with a new one. Just another arrow we get to shoot. It's another arrow we get to shoot. We get to send it off knowing that Jesus Christ is our living hope. That is my hope that I will be that type of grandparent, that type of witness in that child's life. And so uh, excited about that. Uh, they'll be around soon. If you'd like to see a picture, I have plenty. Um, <laughs> and I'll show you after service. Today's going to be a little different. I'm going to teach today. I'm just going to take, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to walk through a passage of scripture. Last week I talked about the Great Commission and how God challenges us to go and that we, we as his people are called to go. And I believe this, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this as maybe I'm getting older or maybe just God is putting more responsibility in my life. And, and as I was sharing this week at this conference, you can see a lot of time there's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into church and having church and doing church. And man, right now, uh, there'd be no way for me to even name all the different volunteers that are currently making this service happen from the, the, the people that are running the lights to the soundboard, to the computer screen that puts the words on the screens, to the people in the other room that are managing the camera angle so that we can record it, so that it can go out tonight, later on, to the children's workers, to the people at the connect counters. Again, there's so many that take but let me just be cl- let me clarify. As, as well as we do church, as well as anybody in the world does church, the greatest message that has ever been known to mankind has never been, can't wait to see you on Sunday. It has always been Jesus Christ died to save the sins of this world. 
And I want us to just kind of lean back into that this morning as we, as sometimes we can take it for granted. I don't know if any of you have ever taken some, have any of you ever lost anything based off neglect? He just didn't pay much attention to it, and, and after a time, it started to kind of erode or, or break down. Or I, I don't know if any of you have ever had a gas grill that you left in your backyard, <laughs> uh, only for it to become really a rust bucket there because you left it open, you didn't cover it. And, and I've had this happen to me before, and so uh, I, I know through neglect you can lose some things. And I'm not, I'm not talking about you losing your salvation this morning, but what I am saying is that there are times that we can neglect what Christ has done in us, and therefore we lose the passion for what Christ can do through us. And I don't want you to lose that passion based off neglect, that we got so busy doing something else that we've missed. And so I want to continue on this theme of the Great Commission, but I want to, I want to come at it from a different angle. You see, God said, go, tell the world, evangelize the world, baptize the world, and then the cycle starts over again. So we're supposed to be a church that wins people, that raises people up, and then sends people. But in sending people, you and I are supposed to live as sent People, God gave you and I a mission. And man, there's been some moments that have stopped the mission. I think probably last year a lot of people felt like the mission stopped based on what was going on in the world and how it was going about. And man, a lot of people just dealt in, in the wrong way. They're saying right now statistically, we, we lose typically about 1,500 churches a year. That's how many close. They're saying because of 2020 over the next three to five years, we could be losing upwards to 3,500 to 4,000 churches a year. Because it's just a, it's a tough year to be in a church. People got really used to doing something else. And so if it takes 28 days to form a new habit, and a lot of churches in our country right now have been shut down for a year, that's a lot of 28 days. That's 12 different options at least to form a new habit, and a lot of people did, and so churches are struggling right now to make it through. And I'm thankful for our church where we just said early on, no, we got to come back. We, we just got to do what we got to do, and we're going to do our best with it, but the reality is I need the house. I, I need people. I need community. I need us to be together. And so, But even in that, it's not to say it's been easy, but it doesn't change the mission. You see, the mission, no matter what happens in a moment, the mission doesn't change, and the mission is for us to not simply be a church in this community, but we have to be a church that changes the community. And so in that mission that God has given us of showing real life to real people, as I begin to kind of comb through this passage in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to just kind of walk through the tools you need to live sent. There's some things you need to know. There's some things that we have to do as believers. Now, let me just tell you straight up, this is not an easy passage to read. It was not easy for me to walk through and go, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Because I don't really get a choice. It's the Bible. I'm going to agree with what this word says. But if I agree with really what this word says, it's going to call me out from time to time. And when it calls me out, I have two options. I can ignore it or I can obey it. And so today I'm going to read you a bunch of scripture. We're going to go through the entire chapter of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The, the first 15 verses aren't going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read through it. And, so I, and, I, and I've never in my 20 years of pastoring been able to just simply read through a scripture and just keep reading. I'm probably going to stop and talk in between. So I will try my best to get through this, but y'all bear with me. So here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, this scripture, I didn't even get through the first one. We get this scripture, I want to make sure that I explain it, make sure you understand your track with me. I don't know if you've grown up in church and you understand what Paul's talking about. He's saying, he's describing our bodies right now. He's saying, this tent that we live in currently is not going to make it. There's going to come a time where it will break down and then we will leave this life and we will step into a building which is eternal. And he's talking about that place which Christ has prepared for us in heaven, that he's there preparing now for us. And so Paul is saying, this is all temporary. How many of you are thankful that this is all temporary? Amen. Yeah, I'm so glad. My dad used to, when I was uh, little, my dad would sing an old bluegrass song. And he'd sing, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. 
while traveling through. And I always remembered that song because I thought, man, that sounds so depressing. <laughs> A lot of bluegrass songs, if you slow them down, they're really depressing, okay? Or somebody's wife ran off. It's, uh, but, so I'm, I'm listening to this, but this is what Paul's talking about. This tent, that I, this temporary abode that I live in, will give way one day to an eternal building that God has prepared for me. And like I said, I'm so thankful that it's temporary. Why? Because verse 2 starts this, For in this tent we groan. How many of you, as you are getting older, you're realizing that your tent groans? <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> For in this tent we groan, but listen why. Because longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, our house. We long for this to be over. I long to be with Christ. I long to be out of the muck and the yuck that is this current world that we live in. And I can look around and think of a million reasons to want to go home. But I can also look for a lot of reasons and go, I'm not ready to go home yet. There's still work to be done. And so there's a groan that takes place. The, the desire to stay, but the ache to go home. And that's where we live. For if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked while we are still in this tent, we groan because we're burdened. Not that we'd be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may stay swallowed up by life. In other words, this body is eventually going to die even though we desire home. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Well, in verse 6, he jumps in and kind of changes the direction. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. So we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from this body and home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please God. Whether I'm here or I get to go home, the goal is the same. I want to please my Father who is in heaven. And so we know that, but then he goes on and he finishes it up just to remind us of why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Verse 11, Therefore, because of this, because of our desire to be home, because Jesus gave us this ability to be here, and because we are going to live our lives to please him, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Church, this ought to be a battle cry. Knowing what God has done in our life, knowing that one day we'll stand before Him, knowing that at the end of this temporary life there is a permanent home that awaits, knowing this, we persuade others about this message of Jesus Christ. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to you. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast of us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not what is in the heart. I love this part. Verse 13, chapter 5. This may be my new life verse. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. What was happening in Corinth was there was this tension because the church was doing a lot of stuff. And a lot of this stuff seemed a little bit out there. I mean, there were healings taking place. There was some crazy stuff happening in the church that some people understood and some people didn't understand. Then there were some churches that were doing it correctly and other churches that weren't doing it correctly in the city of Corinth. But here's what Paul said. Paul said, you guys are looking at us like we're crazy because of some of the things that happen. You're looking at us like we've lost our mind, like we're beside ourselves. And he says, well, if you look at me and you think I'm beside myself, know this, it is for the cause of God. If you look at me and you think it's a little odd that I, that I might pray for you in the middle of Walmart, that I might stop and ask how your family's doing, that I might just pray that God would heal you right here in the sonic drive through line. If you think I'm a little strange, know that it's all on behalf of God. I'm okay if you look at me a little crazy. I'm okay if you think I'm a little bit out there. If we're beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we're in our right mind, then it's for you. I love that. For the love of Christ controls us. 
Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore, and he died for all, that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who their sake died and was raised. So we get this long passage in verse 1 through 15 of, of who we are. We are those that are, that we're just, we're pilgrims here. We're sojourners here. We're, we don't last here. There's going to be an end to this, whether Jesus coming back or our bodies finally giving out. These tents finally groaning to the point where they can't any longer. But that moment happens and God returns and we get to go home to a, a dwelling, a building. We have this and so we need to take joy in knowing that because God has allowed us the knowledge that there is a home that awaits, we should be persuading others that there could be a home that awaits for them too. We should be telling them that. Why? Well, because there was a God who died for all. There was a Jesus who died for all. And because he died for all, we should spend our lives telling the world that he died for all. That all of them really means all of them. And then we get into where I want to talk to you today. The tools you need. Because verse 16 through the end of the chapter, he gets pretty clear on who we are supposed to be. How many of you sometimes just wish God would tell you who you're supposed to be? Don't it be nice? I'm just going to tell you, I used to say the same thing until I started reading the Bible more in depth and realized that he does tell us who we need to be. It's just not easy. It's just not easy. So let's dive into this right now as we can. Verse 16, I want you to ask for this. This is the number one tool you need to ask for. Is you need to ask for a new perspective in your mind. A new perspective, a new lens in which to see people through. Because when I read this verse, if it hits you like it hit me, then I'm thankful for it because the world's about to get turned upside down. But if it doesn't hit you, then I need you to begin asking your heart some really serious questions throughout today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. From now on. See the therefore? It's in parentheses. Actually, in your Bible, it's probably not in parentheses. I just put it there because you can remove it. You can actually put it on the front. You can actually read the first 15 verses and then start verse 16 with the word so. So, from now on, we regard no one. Say no one, church. According to the flesh. Wait, 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 wait. What? We regard no one. Because of what Christ has done, because of who we are, because we know what he's given us, what he's blessed us with, from this point on, we regard no one through the lens or the eyes of our flesh. What does that mean? It means the people that you don't like, you got to stop. But we're different. Yeah, I'm Democrat. I'm Republican. I'm this. I'm that. you got to look through Christ's lens, not your own. From now on. It's not my words. That's right there. From now on, we regard no one through the lens of flesh. But they hurt me. No, that's a flesh lens. Jesus' lens said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus' lens said, I'll go to the cross and I won't open my mouth about it because somebody's got to do it and you can't. My lens goes, you cut me off in traffic. I'm going to flip you off and follow you to Walmart. I don't know if those were laughs or if those were amens, but somebody get with me. <laughs> From now on. Now I can stop this sermon right now and spend the rest of the day repenting from failing at this point. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though, I love how Paul puts this in there, even though you once regarded Christ through the flesh. But that changed, didn't it? See, there was a time you thought this whole Jesus thing was a little crazy until your faith started to grow. Until you said yes to him and he started showing up in your life. And you started realizing that it was something amazing. And it wasn't magical. It was, it was divine. It was something that only Christ could do in you. And at one time you thought those people were crazy. Because you were looking at them through the flesh. But now he's changed you. And so all Christ is asking us to do in this situation is to view others like he viewed us. Through a lens that was divine, not a lens that was fleshly. Regardless of what you think. But Vince, they disagree with me. Yep, they will. So I don't think that I like them. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, the last year, if it taught us nothing else, it taught us how to not like one another over things that don't matter. We'll get mad about a Dr. Seuss book, a Mr. Potato Head, and all kinds of stuff. Think about it. 
We all talk about the pandemic, but man, that was, that was really a, just a, a, a slice of what we've seen in the last year. I mean, we've seen natural disaster, we've seen social injustice, we've seen racism exposed in areas, we've seen just some vile things that have occurred, and they're still occurring. It's not something that's just going to go away. I hope that you all understand this. This world is broken. It didn't just break. It's been broken since the garden. This isn't a new development. The thing that's different is that we're moving into a different time where the Bible mentions the time of Noah like this, that sin would abound so people wouldn't even blush. Nothing embarrassing, nothing was shameful to them. And so we're shifting into this idea now where whatever, however, whoever, whenever, that type of mindset and those of us that are of Christ, we war against it because we go, no, that's not who we're supposed to be. But I'm going to ask you a question here in just a moment. Are we called to love the sin or are we called to love the sinner? So why do we get our lens so jacked up? Because they disagree with me. Then, then that makes you a control freak. It doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Because Christian, the Word tells us from now on, from now on your perspective needs to change. Why? Well, because God gives us the perspective in verse 17. 2 Corinthians verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How many of you have that verse in your house somewhere on a coffee cup, a calendar, a plaque, small ceramic thing that sits on your bookshelf? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. Woo! We'll preach that, except that it's attached to the verse ahead of it. Therefore, means you've got to flip up and you've got to look through this other filter. What's the filter? It says you should be able to see people like Jesus sees people, that they are new in Christ Jesus. But most of us, we don't give them that shot. We only see them as what they've been or what they currently are. and Jesus sees them as who they could be. Well, I don't know. You better because he saw you that way. He saw you that way from a cross when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand fully. Somebody made the quote this week, and it just floored me. I don't know if you've ever been gut punched by God, but this was one of those moments for me because I was just kind of worn through this. Like, no, God, there are things that are wrong that people do that are wrong, and I'm supposed to stand against it, and I don't, I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be in the world but not of the world. I'm supposed to hate the sin and love the sinner, and I get all that, but, Lord, there are people that are just against us. That was my argument with God. And as if God grabbed this person over here and made them a mouthpiece, this person said, hey, can I ask you a question? Do you see those that come against you as enemies or do you see them as what they really are? Prisoners of war. They are prisoners of the other side and they don't even know it. But you do, and yet you attack them as if they're still your enemy and not someone you could rescue. And I had to sit down. I had to sit down and go, God, when did I stop seeing people, certain people, as folks that I couldn't rescue and just saw them as too broken? And he had to change my perspective. He had to, I, he had to come in and do some work in my heart. And it's not easy, but if I'm going to follow Christ the way Christ wants me to follow him, and all this stuff, as we go, we're just in number one, as we go down through this list, you're going to see how they're all connected here in a moment. You've got to have a new lens. You've got to have a new perspective to see people, not as what we think they should be, but as Christ knows they are called to be. And that's okay. It may not look like what you think it's going to look like. I was talking with a friend the other day, and we were talking about theology, and he was talking about whether we speak in tongues, we don't speak in tongues, do you believe in healing, do you not believe in healing, do you believe in this, do you believe in that? I said, you know what I believe? I believe that we're all going to get to heaven, and, we're, and I think God's got a special room for preachers. And we're going to all show up at the same time, because the Bible says that when we get into heaven, we will know as we are known. In other words, they won't, everybody goes, I got so many questions when I get to heaven. You won't have to ask them, because the moment you get there, you'll know. That's going to be awesome, right? Yes. 
Except there's going to be a moment in this room for preachers where we're all going to get in the same room together. We're going to all look at you and go, oh, wow, I missed that one. Woo! My bad, dude. Sorry. Sorry. It's going to be crazy. Because we just, we, we, so, we get so wrapped up in stuff. And this last year has proved that we get so wrapped up in stuff that doesn't change anything about someone's eternity. And in doing that, we neglect the greatest story ever told, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, you need a new perspective. From now on. From now on, you view everyone. You view everyone through the lens of Christ. Why? So that they are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. That's why. Well, that's great, but how do I do that? All right, let's keep going. Glad you asked how you do that, because I'm about to tell you how you do that. Second tool you need is a heart for reconciliation. A heart to bring things back together. Verse 18 says, All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. He wasn't counting their trespasses, their sins against them, but he was entrusting us with the message of reconciliation, of putting it back together. So here's the big picture of that scripture. God says, hey, I want you to get a new lens. All right, God, I want a new lens. What's the lens I should see through? You need to look at people as how can you bring them back to God? Uh, gosh, I don't know that I'm your man on that, God. No, you are, because see, here's the message. Here's the ministry of reconciliation. I am God, and the rest of the world sits over here separated from me. So what I've done is I'm giving you the ministry of reconciliation through Jesus Christ, who was the bridge. He made this people able to connect back with this God through Jesus Christ. That's the message of reconciliation. That's the ministry. So you and I have a job to do. He calls it a ministry in verse 18. Ministry is an action word. You don't say, I'm in the ministry. You do the ministry. It is an action. It is a job. It is something we take on. And so God says, hey, I'm giving you this ministry of reconciliation. What that means is that i got to take you and put you back with God as best as I can. And then when you get back with God, then me and you got to come take you back to God as good as we can. And then the three of us are going to go grab three more people and go, hey, I want to take you from here to there because I have been given the ministry of reconciliation by God himself. Do you see that as your role? I'm finding most Christians don't see that as their role. We'll say things like, hopefully God can save them. Well, maybe someone will reach them. Yeah. Maybe someone will reach them. But after today, you've been given this scripture, so you have no excuse. You have to reach them. You have to reconcile them back to God. You have to be the one that gets in the way. And anything less, and this was hard for me to wrap my mind around, anything less is disobedience to God. He doesn't say you should. He doesn't say if you want to. He doesn't say be a good idea. He says this is who we are as, as the children of God. Well, how do I know that? Because it keeps going in the passage. He keeps going in the passage in regards to reconciliation. He says that you have been reconciled so that you can reconcile other people. You have been brought back to God so that you can bring back others to God. And so in verse 20, he says, Therefore, because you've been reconciled, you are an ambassador for Christ, making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Jesus, come back to God. You want to be an ambassador of Christ? There's your call. There's your mission. As an ambassador, a representative of the kingdom of God, here's what you're supposed to do. You didn't think it was in there. It's right here. Here's what you're supposed to do. Bring them back to God. Who? All of them. All of them. Then, no, don't lessen it. Don't lessen it. Don't lessen God's power based on your ability. The only thing that lessens God's power is your availability or lack thereof. 
Because if God can make a donkey talk, he can make me and you do stuff. Right? Am I right? This is not easy for me to look at this and realize that there have been parts in my Christian walk that I've been missing because I have set aside thoughts or ideas or, or I, I, my lens was maybe a little hazy or maybe the filter in which I was putting people behind wasn't what God's filter was. God said, Vince, I want you to be an ambassador of Christ. I'm like, that's what I do. That's what I do, God. I, I, I'm an ambassador for Jesus. I, I stand up every week and I preach his word and I, and I tell people about your church and about your kingdom. I am an ambassador for God. He said, have you been imploring people? Have you been begging people? Come back to God. And I haven't been. Not like I once did. Neglect. Busyness. All those things get in the way. And God didn't release you from them. He didn't release you from this call. This call to reconcile. This call to be an ambassador, a representative of the kingdom of God. He didn't release you from that. He said, no, no, no. You need to be involved. I won't spend a lot of time on being an ambassador because most everybody understands that. But then Paul goes into this last part, and I want to I spend some time here. He goes into this last part of the chapter. He closes out the chapter. And he says, for our sake, verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a theological term here that gets used and the word is impute. That God imputed our sin onto Jesus. So what does that mean? It means to have laid, and we, we, we change this, we, we say we're going to lay, we, we laid our sin on Jesus. That's really nice, but it's not necessarily true. Our sin wasn't laid upon Jesus. The Bible says that God made Jesus not, it doesn't say, put the scripture back up there if you don't mind, Dom, for me. Verse 21, I want you guys to see this as we walk through this. For our sake, he made him to be a sinner. Is that what it says? Does it say he made him to be a sinner? He made him to be sin. You know the difference? Are we supposed to love the sin or love the sinner? You know what happens with sin? Sin separates us from God. That's what happens with sin in your life and in my life. When we sin, when there is a willful transgression of a known law of God, that's called sin. But God didn't make Jesus a sinner. It wasn't just that He carried my sin. He became sin. That's where we get this moment on the cross where Jesus looks into the heavens and He says, My God, my God! Why have you turned away from me? Because your sin. And I can't look upon it. You guys know the story. The Bible tells us that the crucifixion, the earth shook, the veil torn in the temple, the clouds rolled in, there was darkness over the earth for hours. Why? Because because our sin wasn't just placed on Jesus. Jesus became our sin. Because that's the only way it would have worked. See, I, I love you, but I can't take on your sin. I love you, but I can't, I can't do that. I can take the blame for something, but I can't take away the eternal consequence for your sin. Jesus did. And so what, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean? And here's how it worked. When God looked at Jesus early in the ministry and even up until this moment on the cross, he looked and he saw his son. He saw that which he had sent. He saw the redeemer of the world. He looked down into heaven and he saw him. And we hear that in the prayer. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, I thirst. And, and he's praying these things. And then all of a sudden something shifts when this happens. When now when God looks from heaven, he doesn't see Jesus. He sees your sin. My sin, all of it, 
And God in heaven, while looking down, has no option but to turn. And a world without a God looking upon it gets dark fast. Say, why? Why would God do that? Why would God, why would God do something like that? Why would he put his son in a place where he had to turn his back on him and only see the sin so the flip side of that could happen? You say, what's the flip side of it? Here's the thing. Jesus took what we could never take in order to give us what we could never gain. And what that was was now when Jesus or when God in heaven looks down at Vince, guess what? He doesn't look down and see Vince. He looks down and he sees righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus because just as my sin was imputed to Christ, His righteousness was imputed to me because of the cross. And so all of that sin that defined me for my whole life the sins I had committed and the sins I have yet to commit, all of that sin was buried at the bottom of the sea, was thrown from the east to the west so that Christ's righteousness would be on me. Some of you this morning, you forgot. You forgot all he took from you. All the shame and the sin and the guilt, the choices that you should have, I should have died for, that he took all that. That that he took it so that you could have something greater, that, that you could have hope when you leave this tent that there is a home that awaits. So that you could have hope that this Christ who died did it for all people, you included. So that you could have hope that someone who is far from God can be reconciled because you and I were. So that you and I could have hope that we would be called ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because God took your sin and He replaced it with righteousness. I want you to go tell your world. I want want you to go tell your world Look at them through the lens of Christ, regardless of how broken they are, regardless of the choices they've made. Vince, you saying you want a bunch of broken, messed up people here? Yes! How many of you already fit in that category? All I want is more. And not because of selfish reasons, but because my job as a believer, my call as a Christian is to reconcile, to bring back those who have walked away. That's your job. That's my job. Maybe you're here this morning. I want you to bow with me, church. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I need to. Maybe you're here this morning and you didn't know that God has been crying out through the ages. That he has been shouting through history for you to come back. Come back. Be reconciled to me. Come home. Come back. Come back. And maybe you missed it. Maybe you didn't realize that's what the cross did. It wasn't just something we talk about on Easter. It is something that changed history. It's something that that affected eternity. And it was something that was done specifically for you. And so although you may not know it, there is a Jesus who is crying out for you saying, come back. I know you've been gone for a while. Come back. Christian, you may know this Jesus, but you've been cold. Maybe you've just been indifferent. Maybe you stopped seeing people through the right lens of brokenness and how can I bring them back to the Father? And you've just said they're too far gone. I can't believe the decisions they're making. And you spent more time talking about them to someone else rather than talking to God about the real issue of sin. Today, why don't you come back? I'm going to leave the altar open right now. It's open. If you know right now in your heart that you need to come back, then step forward. Come down here and pray. God, I got to come back. God, I, I, I forgot what you did for me. I forgot, or I didn't even know what you'd done for me. If that's you this morning, then you come forward. Come forward. 
God, I've grown cold. I don't see people the way I used to see people. I don't love people the way I used to love people. Or God, I definitely don't love them like you love them. I need some help in that. Then come on, come back. Come back. God, heal my heart. God, fix the brokenness in me so that I can see you again clearly, so that I can see your mission clearly, so that I can reconcile the world back to you because that's the ministry you've given me. That's the message you've given me is to reconcile them, to bring them home. But I need a new perspective, God. I need a new lens, God. I need to see it differently, God, and I need your help with that this morning. If that's you, then come on. I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to force you. I'm not, but I'm, it's there. It's there for you. Father, I come to you and I thank you for reconciling me, for bringing me back so that I might bring others with me, for making me an ambassador so that I might tell the world about your kingdom. Forgive me, God, for the times I miss it, for the times I get lazy, times I assume it doesn't matter when in reality it always matters. It always matters. So God, help me see it clearly through this new lens that from now on, God, I would view no one through my own flesh, but I would view them through the eyes of grace redemption, reconciliation. God, help me never to forget that you took all of my sin and gave me all of your righteousness so that one day I could be with you. Father, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Real quick, I want to walk some of you through or all of you through what's coming in a couple weeks. Guys, Easter's two weeks away. Say amen. amen. And I believe that our church ought to be about the Father's business, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and telling the world about him and going and getting them, all of them. All right? I, I don't, I'm not picky. I want them all. All right? So in this process, we, we're going to have some fun with it because, you know, we always like to, we enjoy doing that. So here's your Easter invites this year. There are these big blue cards that are out front. It just says Easter at Real Life Church. It has the service times. We're going to have our regular three services here on Sunday morning. We're going to have a good Friday service on Friday night uh, here at 6. And so you'll have that information on the cards as you pick these up. Now, here's the fun part. So this year we've been doing this series called Love on Purpose. And this idea of love on purpose means that God has given you His love. We love because He first loved us. So He's given us His love but we ought to be intentional with it. So being intentional with it, we wanted to give you some help, maybe some assistance, if you will. So out in the lobby and up here on the front of the stage, and I'm going to call some of you out here in just a little bit, but up on the front of the stage, we have these cards. They're challenge cards. There are three challenge cards, all right? You can't read them? Don't worry. I'll read them to you. The first one says, pay it forward. How many of you know what that means to pay it forward? That's pretty explanatory, right? If you go through the McDonald's drive-thru and this doesn't happen to you, pick a different time because it does happen a lot. All right, people buy, the person in front of you goes, hey, I'm going to buy whoever's behind me food. I'm gonna, and it doesn't have to just be there. It can be however you see fit to pay it forward. You can pay it forward by helping somebody out with this. You can catch their bill before they leave the restaurant. You can pay for their gas before they even know it. I, however you choose to do it, that's the challenge with the pay it forward card. The next one is the take five, give five, or the take five, invite five. We want you to take five of these cards. These cards up here, they're in stacks of five. But if you take one of these, you've got to take five of those. And we want you to go intentionally invite five people, five families, however you choose to do it. But I don't want to come check your car in May and find invites under your seat. Okay? I'm only saying that because I've been right there. I've grabbed a stack of them only to find them in places they shouldn't be, okay? Not in the hands of somebody else. So go invite five. And the last one is a random act of kindness. This is a blast. Go bake cookies, bake a cake, mow somebody's yard, walk their dog, 
offer them something, some form of kindness. We had people pick them up in the first service. They said, I'm going to bake a cake. I'm going to bake some bread this week, and I'm going to go to deliver it. I'm going to wrap this right up in there so they can't help but see it. They won't be able to get to the bread until they get through the invitation. I've said, I think that's a fantastic idea. Just go do something nice for somebody. Now, we also know that you all are incentive-driven people. So there's a big old pit boss smoker out in the foyer that we're going to give away. Now, that's just the place stuff. On these cards, there's a hashtag that says Love on Purpose MH or Love on Purpose Gainesville or GV. And so we want you to hashtag, hey, got rid of my pay it forward card. Hey, got rid of my random act of kindness card. You can go into it or you don't have to say a word about it. Just let us know you did it. And that's going to put you in the drawing for the smoker outside. Also, for every one of those hashtags that we see and that we count, we're going to provide meals to our community. We're going to provide clothes. We're going to provide outreach from the church level. So this is a church level outreach, this is an individual level outreach, and ultimately it's an eternal outreach because somebody right now has no idea they're going to walk into church on a Sunday morning or a Friday night around Easter time, and they are going to meet the Savior of the world. And you and I get to do that. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to call you forward. We're getting ready to dismiss. If you want to leave, you're welcome to leave, but here's you go. You can give an, in the offering in the buckets as you leave. You can give on your phone at 84321 and just text the dollar amount. But today as you leave, when I say go be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and come back next week, Real Life Church, because we're going to celebrate what God has done. Don't leave without grabbing some. So there are some up on the stage right now. So on the count of three, I'm going to count to three, and you can either leave and go get them in the counter. Or you can leave and come up here and get them off the stage. But I want you to take the challenge to love someone on purpose. I want you to take the initiative to go tell somebody about Jesus because he is still saving souls and he's still changing lives. God bless your real life church. Here we go. One, go be the hands and feet of Jesus. Two, come back and tell us a story next week. Three, come get your cards. We'll see you next Sunday, real life.